Hey folks, welcome back to True Stories with me, Sherry Weens. If you haven't yet subscribed, click that little red button below. And if you'd like to be notified of my posts first, just click that bell right beside it. It'll send you a notification as soon as I post. Okay, so I have an amazing story that I stumbled across from 48 Hours Live to Tell. Now, I really enjoy this show because it's all about survivors that have been through something traumatic and crazy, and they live to tell their story. So this story is about a woman. Her name is Jennifer. Jennifer Shewitt is, she was a young girl who grew up in Dickinson, Texas, and in the summer of 1990, things just went very wrong. She lived um, in a single dwelling mother home and um, she often slept with her mother in her bed actually, just because they were so close. Um, it so happened that this evening, um, Jennifer's mother asked her if she could go and sleep in her own bed because she had to get up for work in the morning and Jennifer was kicking. She was only eight years old, remember? So she said to her mom, because I love you, I'm going to go and sleep in my own room. So she went into her room and it was at that point that she had turned on her light. And that's sort of what I guess what alerted the perp from outside was that that caught his attention was the light that was shining. Um, he said that something about that room made him think there was a little girl in there. So, um, what ended up happening is this guy who we knew who we now know is Dennis Bradford he ended up sneaking in through her window and carrying her out after she had fallen asleep so he's carrying her out of her out of her place and down the street and she wakes up and she starts trying to scream and he covers her mouth and he sticks her in his vehicle and drives away and he proceeds to tell her that he's an undercover police officer and that she doesn't need to be scared um but she was and something in her gut told her that he wasn't really a police officer um very very scary sad so he drives her to a deserted area and he ends up brutally hurting her, raping her, and he cuts her throat literally from ear to ear. Um, and then he drags her off into the bush area and leaves her there to die. Now, later on, there's children in the area that were playing and they were playing hide and go seek right around her body. She said she couldn't scream. She couldn't lift her head. She could hear that there were vehicles and people close by, but she couldn't call for any help. She was just helpless laying there, right? And these children that were playing in the field, one of them happened to trip over her foot and that's how she got found. And next thing you know, the police came and she was helicopter airlifted out of the area straight to the hospital obviously for surgery once she gets into the hospital and starts she got surgery for her throat slashing her trachea was cut and it was it was lucky that there wasn't any main arteries that were in the way or things could have been way way deadlier for her so she couldn't speak, um, but she could uh, write and she was alert with her eyes. So, you know, it was often viewed like while she was in, you know, their care, she was often scared because, you know, there might there was a police officer outside. But this man told her that she was a police officer and she just didn't even know who to trust anymore. And she was surely very, very scared of men. So she didn't even like the doctors coming too close to her and stuff. They had to spend a lot of time consoling this poor girl after such a traumatic situation. She ends up starting to write out details about who this guy is and, you know, what he's done and what he said to her. Um, the fact that his name was Dennis and, you know, that he had all she had all these little clues of, you know, that tips that she could give the authorities to help find this man. Now, at the crime scene, they did find a few articles of clothing that they believed to be um, Jennifer's as well as the perpetrator so they bagged up that evidence but back the, in the 90s there wasn't very there wasn't any dna testing so this was just evidence that was sort of filed in this case and 
and sort of of left there, you know, and they 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 never could find this guy, you know, based on on even just having a sketch artist come in and do a physical face face of this guy, and it's shocking how similar that sketch ends up being to the actual perpetrator. How much detail that Jennifer was able to remember is just it's just amazing. Even with all the details that Jennifer was able to provide to the, to the police, they weren't able to track down who this person was. And it really wasn't until about 19 years later that they ended up getting that DNA tested and getting some information for a name of, of Dennis Bradford to find out who this guy is. Now, they ended up locating him in Arkansas and going down and speaking with the authorities down there and... They got him pulled over, arrested on a warrant, and they hauled him in for questioning. And they asked him straight out if he knew Jennifer um, Shewitt. And he said that he had heard the name and that he heard that she had went missing um, in Texas and that he had prayed for her. Now, he knew all along sitting in that chair that he had everything to do with that, and they did too. And it was odd that even in the interview, he was sort of like... You know, he really didn't want to say what all he had done, as heinous as it was. Um, but the authorities kept pressing on him. They weren't going to let him get out from under it. And he, when he heard that Jennifer was still alive, he literally broke down crying. Like, just broke down crying. He said for the last, like, 20 years, he's been looking over his shoulder and he's been scared and he's been, like, worried and this has been eating away at him that he thought that he killed this little girl. Meanwhile, she survived, you know, so the police are telling him how amazing of a woman she is now. Now in the interrogation, the officers give Dennis a chance to sort of, you know, say there's two sides to every story. You know, you can tell us what happened and, you know, maybe it was an accident and he straight up says, no, like I, she was innocent, I totally, hurt her, she did nothing, you know, and I don't even know why I did it, he says. So, absolutely brutal. Obviously, he gets sent to jail and is awaiting going to trial. They ask um, Jennifer, you know, to create sort of a victim impact statement to take to trial so that she can say her piece after so many years of searching for answers as to who did this to her. She was finally able to lay this to rest and confront this man. And so she starts writing her victim impact statement and they choose the exact day, 20 years later. So August 10th was the day that she was abducted in 1990. So 20 years later, they choose the exact same day and they decide that's when they're going to go to trial. So she starts to prepare herself and doesn't Dennis cowardly take his own life? And, you know, when he was arrested, Jennifer specifically said, don't let him kill himself. So absolutely brutal, heart wrenching that she wasn't able to actually say this to his face because he took his own life. So he never waited for her to say her piece. Um, she ended up deciding to go to his grave site and say her piece to him there. And as she's sitting there reading out her impact statement with her husband by her side, she turns to him and she says, do you think that he heard me? And right then and there, an ant bit her. And she, she knew instantly that he had, she had been heard, that he heard her fully. You know, I think that was, you know, higher power saying, yep, you know, he heard you. So what an amazing story that this woman was able to grow throughout her life and continue learning and, and just being a wonderful person and, and building her own family, you know, and after going through something so traumatic, I feel like, you know, she's an inspiration and she her story deserves to be shared. So I thought if, if you guys, you know, would really like to hear this as well, if you enjoyed this story, you know, a thumbs up would be a really great support, you know, share it if you'd like. Um, you know, I think that it's very encouraging and empowering to see something like that when somebody goes through something so traumatic and can come out of it such a beautiful person in the end, too. So thanks for watching, folks. Stay safe out there and we'll see you again next time. Bye for now.